1951, Ralph Sexton Sr., my great-grandfather, landed at the port of Haifa. He landed there with a boat full of Holocaust survivors from Europe on a ship called the SS Kedma. Kedma meaning to go east in Hebrew, and that's exactly what he did. He came to this land from Naples, Italy. And here I am, the fourth generation. I'm here today with my grandfather, Dr. Ralph Sexton Jr., his son, and I'm here for my 14th time. This is my grandfather's 60th time to be in the nation in the land of Israel. Our family has always loved Israel. We have a heart for study here in the land, the land of the Bible, something that my great-grandfather and my grandfather referred to as the fifth gospel. But this time, this trip, I'm here for a different reason. We're here together for a reason that maybe we never thought we would be here for, and that's to document the massacre of October the 7th, the terrible, horrendous terrorist attack that took the life of over a thousand Israelis and injured over 4,000. Today, at the time of filming, this is the fifth month of a war that has ensued in Gaza as a result of that attack. And we're here today in Israel to give you a first-hand eyewitness account of all of the atrocities that took place on that day. We'll take you to Kibbutz Beri, a place that seemed like a quaint, quiet little town that would never be harmed by anything like it saw on that day. We'll take you to the site of the Supernova Music Festival. We'll take you to a graveyard of vehicles where over 1,200 vehicles are there, shot, riddled with bullets and RPGs. And we'll tell you stories that are hard to imagine, hard to describe. This trip is different than any other trip. This trip is dedicated to telling the story of the massacre of my people. Thank you so much for joining us today. As you can see, Pastor Winston Parrish and I are in Jerusalem, Israel. And we're continuing these roundtable discussions that God prompted us to do a couple of years ago when uh, Winston and I were uh, talking on the phone late at night. And what we said was, uh, we, it's not going to happen, it is happening. And we decided the next morning to meet and we started flying around the world to see the sites where Bible prophecy is happening. And we're in Jerusalem, Israel. The sun has gone down. And Pastor Winston, I love you, man. Thank you for being with me and the sirens in the background. And tell us where we're located, what's right behind us. Yes, sir. So right here in the old city of Jerusalem, the Jaffa Gate is right here beside us. And uh, it's an honor to be back in the land. It's our first time since the October 7th terrorist attack. We were here in September right. of 2023, right before the attacks took place. And uh, we're coming up on 150 days tomorrow, as of time of recording this, uh, 150 days since the October 7th attack. And so it's, it's wonderful to be back home. It's definitely a, a different feeling. There's a somberness on the nation and uh, there's a lot to discuss. There is. I, I'm thankful that we're here and thankful for all that God has allowed our ministry to, to accomplish for His glory, uh, even since 2018 and 2019, going all the way back. And uh, God's really opened some incredible doors. We're incredible honored to have doors. you here. And uh, looking forward to 
the next few days of intense study and talking with people. We, we're here, obviously, to hear some firsthand accounts of everything that's taking place. Right. Step back and, and look at a 10,000 foot view with a biblical perspective of everything that's happening. And uh, we want to encourage folks at home, uh, if, if you're a student of the Bible, if you're, if you're not, if you're searching, if you're looking for answers, right. uh, this is maybe a place for you to get some, some information, some facts from uh, really from firsthand sources and then from what we see and hear. And I'm looking forward to that for the next few days. It's I've, be been in, I've been in country a few hours. I've already had two conversations and I shared that with you and Andrew. And by the way, thank you, Andrew Weinbarger, for traveling with us and doing an outstanding job. He's got enough equipment on this balcony and in the rooms behind us to make CNN and Fox News embarrassed. He did a great job. Great job. But I've already had two interviews or conversations, one with a Muslim man I've known for over 30 years and one from a young IDF reservist who uh, helped me at the airport today, spent about 30 minutes with me, opened up, started talking about his family. And I've got an understanding and something that I can't get off TV at home. Uh, I can't get it from a newspaper report or a magazine. Looking people in the eye and hearing the tension right. in their voice. I can't, I guess is the right way to put it. And no matter, with us living in the States and having the perspective that we do, obviously we have friends here, right. we can talk to them, but as soon as we got off the plane, it, it was palpable. There's obviously, uh, there's tension and, there and, and, for, and for good cause, for the right reasons, right. Uh, in, that, in the sense that it has changed life and it has changed life forever in Israel. We talked to uh, one of our good friends and, and we're, we were talking about the comparisons between what's taking place right now, this, this war that is going on as a, as a subsequent attack took place. But uh, what is the difference? What is the comparison between the Intifadas and what we're, we're seeing now? And his words were, they're completely different. During the Intifadas, we were able to live. We were able to, to move about. We were able to enjoy life. life we still were all groups over. Right. Life seemingly went on. Uh, right now, uh, none of that is happening. Life right. has totally changed here. Uh, on both ends of the spectrum for, for the Jewish community and for, for Christian Palestinians and for Muslim Palestinians that live inside Israel proper. Some right. of them have worked and lived here for a long time. The entire world has changed from, and, and again, if we back out from 10,000 feet again, uh, from the war in Ukraine and Russia, right? everything is changing, everything is inflamed. Uh, nothing maybe will ever be the same. And we're going to dive into that tonight. We want to talk about how we got to this place. Right, we do. Um, we want to go all the way back to 2016, some conversations that were had, and, and really give a, a focus, um, focused attention to, to how we got to this point. Because it's easy to see uh, if we pay close attention. Well, I want to speak to our family and friends at home and the churches that support us. I want to just take this moment as I'm sitting here in Jerusalem, Israel, to thank you for your friendship. I want to thank you for your support. I want to thank you for your prayers and for what you have done to follow a burden and a vision that I had way back at the first part of COVID. I kept thinking this doesn't feel right. It's not just a, another flu or an avian bird flu. There's something going on, an energy or something. And we literally began to explore everything from the United Arab Emirates to Kuwait, to Europe, to Poland, to Belgium, to France, to Germany, and then all the cities in America, Philadelphia, Washington, D.C. You went with us to New York, you traveled, and you gave, you prayed, and you supported. Now, here in Jerusalem, we can feel it coming together. Number one, we know that this is an, an unbelievable time to be a Bible believer. It, it, it was almost maddening when I got off the plane today. I could start seeing the pieces of the biblical puzzle come together. Fascinating, unbelievable. And so when we begin to look at this and study together, I realized that together is a multiplier. I couldn't be here if it wasn't for my grandson, my pastor. 
I, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Andrew. And, and so I began to think, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Trinity Baptist Church. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the RSM board. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for my family and friends. We owe each other. And boy, God has just sort of made this come together yes, sir. as a life-changing time for the family of faith. And I think my, I keep going back to what my dad kept talking about and I was trying to process it on the plane today. Dad said, as we get closer to the coming of the Lord, He said, you're going to feel it. You can almost taste it. <laughs> it's hard not to be emotional about those conversations. Yes, sir. In the time in the Word of God, praying together. And he kept hammering into my head the closer we get to the Lord's return, you're going to see the church, the real Bible believer, they're going to move away from playing games. Yes, sir. They're going to move away from picking on each other. <laughs> They're going to start hanging up these labels. Yes, sir. I went to this Bible college. You went to this Bible college. I'm in this group, and I'm in this group, yeah. and you have a church bus, right. and we don't have a church bus, and you've got a screen, and we don't have a screen, and, and all the things that don't matter if the Lord's standing at the door right. knocking right here. Yeah. He's on the way. Yes, sir. To the Mount of Olives. And we're sitting here, and God's opened this door. And, and Dad and I talked, and I said, well, look, if, if God's going to take all that, then what's going to happen to us in Israel? And he said, they will be forced into the arms of the church. Yes, sir. Was that prophetic? Yes, sir. It's incredible to see. It's all happening. into the arms of the church. Everything you've just described in those conversations that you had with him, they are literally happening today. Did you not get a phone call from New York City a few weeks ago that was life-changing when you shared it with me? Yes, sir, about the gentleman who said, where will we hide? Where Tell him a little bit about that. Had Why a, I hunt a handkerchief? <laughs> had, a, had, a, had a dear friend that, that is in the Jewish community and was taking in everything that's happening in, in our world. And obviously we can talk about the October 7th massacre that took place here, but anti-Semitism has, has exponentially risen even in the United States. And it's not just a pro-Israel, pro-Hamas uh, stance. It's right and wrong, good versus evil. And he was worried about the future of our country. He was worried about the future of the United States. and where the Jew would find his place if things became worse. And he was talking from a real heart of, of, of authenticity and, and sincere worry. And he asked the question, where will we go? Where will we hide? Who will hide us? If this becomes like the 30s and people say, there's no way it'll ever become the 1930s again for the Jew. It, it's happening. It, it's, it's it happening. really is. And, and obviously not in the same light and in the same manner, but there is that sentiment that is on the world in a way that it hasn't been since the 20s and the 30s. And through tears, he asked me, where will we go? Will you hide us? Will you care for us? Will you love us? And I, I was able to share with him, obviously, my love for him. And, right. and then was able to point back to Scripture and the truth of what the Bible says. And, of course, we will stand with you. We will love you. And it was an incredible moment that I'll never forget. I never thought I would be asked that question, will you hide us if it comes to that? Well, you had that conversation. I had a conversation with an executive in Israel about three months ago, and they were talking about the political pressure and everything that was happening, and then, uh, you know, what was happening after, right after October 7th, and uh, so 150 days ago, 
and I guess it was in the second or third week after the war broke out, and this is a statement he made to me. He said, we are discovering, we're finding out that our true friends are evangelicals, was the word he used. And I said, what do you mean by that? He said, we were taught sometimes maybe wrongly, but we sort of grew up with grandparents and that, that Christians don't like Jews. Sure. And that you think we killed your Christ. And I had the joy of saying to him, no one killed Christ. Right. Jews didn't kill him. The Romans couldn't do that unless Christ gave himself right. Yeshua, the Messiah. And he said, well, we're finding out that NATO is not our friend. The United Nations is not our friend. And the governments of Europe are not our friends. And then he paused and he said, and even political friends we had counted on in the past, all of a sudden, they're not our friends. Right. So where do we go? And he said, we're finding out that Christians understand this. Right. Christians, that they begin to, because of the biblical connection. And I, I brought a, a clipping off of um, uh, the news service, uh, Router's news service, and this says that the uh, Israeli ambassador was in the United Nations, and he said, this UN is a terror-excusing, Hamas-promoting, victim-blaming organization that has lost every ounce of credibility. Nothing by the UN can be trusted Absolutely. or accepted. I agree. And guess what? And this guy, after this new story broke, the man I was talking to, he said, we found out the evangelicals, the churches have more of an understanding. And then I saw my dad's hands gesturing coming together. Not that we're becoming one religion. That's not what he was talking mm -hmm. about. That He wasn't talking about... The pressure of the world the pushing pressure. the Jew to the only place he can the find arms refuge. of the church. Yes, sir. It's and happened. We, it's happening. And, and he and I talked because both of us had had uh, experiences with people uh, in the states and different religious groups. Uh, and they were trying to, to section our group Christian against Christian with uh, those little things of division or whatever. And, and he said, and that foolishness will go away. The desperation of the hour. And this, in the generation that we're living in, I, I think that God is developing a group of men, a group of leaders, and, and most of them that I'm referring to are, are young men that uh -huh. have been under your influence and men like Pastor Daniel Buchanan who have taught them to pray um, and that they have, they have a heart for what you're talking about. Right. We see the, the, the error of the past generations and where jealousy Mm -hmm. and foolishness robbed the church of much of its identity and much of its unity uh, and its ability to do things like love on Israel. Um, it, it, it robs us of our joy. It robs us of our purpose. And I think it's all intertwined. Mm -hmm. I, I know it seems so far fetched that revival in the church would, would have anything to do with, with our love and support for the nation of Israel and what's happening in the world, but it goes hand in hand. It does. We've talked about this a lot. My generation is struggling with anything to do with eschatology. My generation is struggling with anything to do with end times, the, the second coming, rapture. We've been desensitized to, to a world of sci-fi and AI and all these things that are eroding our sensitivity to the supernatural. Right. Our God and is that's understandable sure, for them, isn't it? Absolutely, and, and our heart is to help uh, help navigate those waters and, and come back to a scriptural understanding. But we have to be a people who are about our Father's business. Right. We talk a lot about the gospel, being sincere to the gospel, but if we're sincere to the Word of God and we're sincere to what it says, we have to be as sincere about the grace of God and the love of God as much as we are sincere about those things as we are to th the fact that Jesus is coming again. Right. There, he has promised us that he would come again. Uh, there, there is a 
there is a moment in time that only the Father knows where the bride will be united with the bridegroom. Right. That day is coming. We don't know when. If anybody tells you they, that they know when Jesus is coming again, you need to find another pastor to listen to, another teacher to listen to, uh, because it's not true. The Bible teaches us clearly. But we have to live with that spirit of expectation right. that what, is, what if this is my last day on earth? Right. What am I going to do for Christ? How am I going to represent Christ? And what am I going to do through my New Testament local Bible-believing church? And when we get when we get the petty things like what you're talking about, right? The petty things that erode our ability to be the people that God calls us to be. The consequence of that is a biblical understanding of Israel, right? A biblical understanding of end times prophecy study. You, you hear the word prophecy now in my generation. People in, in anywhere between the age of 30 and 40, there's so much skepticism that comes with that. An effort like this, being here together in Jerusalem, so many of our friends that are watching on YouTube, they're watching on our Facebook page, they need to hear it come out of our mouths. Right. There is a biblical approach to all of this. You don't have to look at it with a skeptical eye. You can look at it with a biblical perspective, dive deep into the Word of God, and take this incredibly maddening, sin-sick world that's full of war and aggression and pain and be able to come out on the other end of it right. in victory. In victory. In victory. And in joy. And in joy. The entire, the entire reason I'm on this earth <laughs> is to glorify God in everything that I say, everything Amen. that I do, and to enjoy being in His presence, being a part of His family. I walked through the airport today. I walked into this hotel today, and I walked in there and, and put on a clean shirt and got ready to meet you and Andrew tonight. And three times I thought, oh, it feels good to be at peace with God, Amen. at peace with yourself, right. and to have the joy. Yes, sir. It's what the world doesn't have, <laughs> and we have it. The Ukraine, joy. U Ukraine and Russia are in a war. Title V of NATO's charter is getting ready to be invoked. At any <laughs> moment, that could happen. We're adding more member nations to NATO. One incursion by Russian troops. The whole <laughs> world's at war. China's on the move. All these, all these pieces are happening. The United States politically is absolutely crumbling. <laughs> the economy is tanking. There's all this pressure. The entire world feels like it is engulfed in flame. Yes. But the church, the church remains with, with joy with and with joy. peace and with a purpose. And I think so many people in my day, in my generation, and I, and I think it's beautiful how God has set this up, your age, the, the tenure that God's given you with people and, uh -huh. and, and with ministry and, and the, the audiences that you're able to reach from 9 to 99. And then for me and, and for Andrew, uh, our age group to be represented at this right. table tonight and have the opportunity to learn and to grow right. and, and to say, hey, there is hope for us. There is. We, we don't have to live uh, under that pressure. We can really we can really rise above, not in pride, no. but, but because God's given us a purpose. And there's a joy that you can't put into words, uh, not only that I'm doing God's will, I'm doing what the best I know, and I always qualify that with the light or the understanding from the Word right. of God that, I'm not, that I have right this moment. That might change tomorrow, right? but I have that peace and that joy. And all those things you just mentioned, Andrew's got this big camera that's back in the room and it's pointing here to the walls of the old city. And there's David Citadel and the Jaffa Gate and all of this is here. But look above it, you see that skyline? That, that's over the Mount of Olives. Yes, sir. And all that stuff that you just mentioned is gonna go away. Yes, sir. In an instant. In an it instant. won't matter. No. Yeah. Prince of Peace. Yes, sir. This life truly is a vapor. And that's not fiction? No, sir. And we're here in Israel together to talk about it, to study it. We want you to be a part of this conversation. This is a part of a multi-day opportunity for us to record content, bring it to you on our YouTube channel on ralphsexton.com. If you are watching on YouTube, we'd ask that you subscribe to the channel, like this video, maybe share it with your friends or family. If you're watching on YouTube, Facebook, please make sure you leave us a comment. Let us know where you're watching from. Maybe even mention your church and your pastor. We'd love the opportunity to pray for your church and your pastor specifically as a ministry. 
and uh, we're thankful for you. Oh, we're my. thankful for your heart. Uh, every time we come here, I'm reminded this is your heart oh. and this is your hope. And uh, we're looking forward to, to many conversations. We're going to go back a few days before the October 7th massacre, and we're going to understand together how we got to where we are. 150 days ago, Hamas attacked Israel. October the 7th, 2023 is a day that we will never forget. Obviously, it's been compared to 9-11 in the United States, mm. and uh, it's been compared to uh, Pearl Harbor, surprise attack. Right. Tons of loss of life. And here we are. The war continues on. Mm -hmm. uh, the, United, the United States has backed, has supported the effort in ways that maybe caught some folks off guard. That initial response, we'll talk about that in a moment. But we have to go back to 2016 to really begin the process of talking about how we got to the place we are. If you go back to the Trump administration, Donald Trump becomes president. Right. His son-in-law, Jared Kushner, becomes one of his senior political advisors. Right. He then becomes his advisor on the Middle East. Uh, he becomes friends with Mohammed bin Salma, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia. Right. He calls him a visionary. He talks about his willingness to do things that maybe are outside the comfort zone of the Saudi royal family, that it's gonna change things forever. The Abraham Accords come from all of that. Right. But all of the pressure that we are talking about, that we're seeing, and even the, the October the 7th massacre, all of it is linked back to the warming of Mohammed bin Salman, the Saudi Arabian uh, royal family with Israel, with the United States, the Abraham Accords, and then the implications that Saudi Arabia and Israel would normalize relations. And so let's talk about that a little bit in detail, how we got to this place. Why, why does Iran care? Because we have to talk about Iran. Right. Why does Iran care that Saudi Arabia and Israel would normalize relations? How does Yemen play into this with the Houthis? What, what, is, what is our perspective as Bible believers of all of this taking place uh, and, and really understanding how far this war could go? Yeah, well, uh, what you just uh, covered is so much in the Word of God. One thing that uh, I've always gone back to in Psalms 83, verse 3 says, They have taken crafty counsel against thy people and consulted against the hidden ones. That's the Jews that are scattered around the world. And they said, Come and let us cut them off from being a nation. That's the nation of Israel. That the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. And so we had that mindset for decades. No Israel, no Israel, no Israel. And the, the head of the snake was Iran. Right, not and, Hamas. No, it's Iran. Right. And because Iran is oil rich, right. then, you know, depending on who you read after uh, in the Wall Street Journal or the London Times, it depends, they may make a million dollars a week off of oil, right. four million a month. And if we, and they've got that to invest in the Houthis, they don't have anything, uh, but all their rockets and missiles are Iranian and of all strange things, North Korea and China. Right. So they've got this new Axis building. And so when the uh, Saudi Arabians saw that the peace accords were working for years. How do they bring all this together? How do we bring it together? How do, because we've got the Palestinian issue, we've got the West Bank, we've got the Golan Heights, we've got Gaza. And what happened was during this administration where, where Jared Kushner had access, then he began to go around or circumnavigate the Palestinian problem right. and went straight to the Saudis. It made the Palestinian resistance, and we'll call it that, resistance uh, irrelevant. It did. Yeah. And so when that happened, what you ended up with is this Iranian, now we got to go to religion. Right. Now we got to go to the fact that there's two schools of Muslim thought. Right, and, and Hamas itself won 
it beat out the Palestinian Authority in 2005 by saying that the Palestinian Authority was not Islamic enough to rule Gaza. And so we when, have the Islamic with, jihadist. When with Islam was Hamas's slogan in 2005. That's how they won the popular vote from the people is they made it all about religion. If you truly love Allah, if you want to be a good Muslim, you will put us you in power. You will vote for Hamas. Right, which brings us back to, to a lot of what you're saying about Iran. The charter itself of Palestinian Islamic Jihad, which is one group that operates inside right. of the Gaza Strip, the charter of Hamas itself, another group that was responsible for the October 7th massacre that is inside the Gaza Strip, the ruling right. political power is a terrorist organization. Right. When we talk about in the United States about coming to the table, having peace agreements, it's awfully hard to have a peace agreement with someone who does not believe that you should even exist. And that's what's created so much of the tension. It goes straight back to what the Word of God says. It's yeah. utter, complete, total confusion. How am I supposed to sit at a table with someone who wants to annihilate my entire family, take away all of my land, kick me out of, of, of any opportunity to be a nation, to be a state? Right. They operate themselves on the idea, backed by Iran, funded by Iran, that right. Israel should not exist. From the river to the sea, sea Palestine should be free. And the river is the Jordan right. River, and the sea is the Mediterranean. So, Pastor, what we're faced with is a problem we can't solve. Right. <laughs> exactly. How but, am I supposed to have peace with someone who wants to wipe me off the, the map? Because, you, and, and you've got Iran feeding Hezbollah, feeding Hamas, right. feeding the Houthis, and then they're now also aiding ISIS and Libya, right. which we defeated in Iraq. So to really get this picture, and, and we don't really want to take time sometimes to talk through it, you got to go past 2005 and then let's back up to the Six Day War. Right. And then let's back up, that's when they, uh, Israel got Gaza. Right. And then we back up past to that to 1917 uh, and the Balfour Treaty. Right. And then in 1922, this is going to be the beautiful nation of Israel and this is going to be the state of Palestine. And everybody keeps talking about a two-state solution. We had one in, in 1922. Right. And then the Brits changed their mind, gave 71%. Look this up. Go to the CIA maps. This is not Ralph. 71% of the real estate that was given to Israel was taken away right. and given to a tribe here in the Middle East called the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. And so now we've got Jordan and we've got Israel. And so when you talked about 2005, there were 9,000 Jewish families in Gaza with the beautiful farms employed hundreds and hundreds of, of citizens from Gaza, and, and the Israeli army went into Gaza. Right. Not to fight Palestinians, right. but to get Jews to leave. And it, and it really erodes the argument, and I know this, this upsets some people, but it's just the fact of right. the matter. <clears throat> if you want to call the Israeli state, the nation of Israel, an apartheid regime, Right. I don't think you understand what apartheid really is. There are 2.2 million Arabs living in Israel proper today. With who passports. Have, who have passports that say State of Israel, who have yellow tags on their car with, with the Star of David. So we don't understand apartheid if we're calling it an apartheid regime. It goes way beyond anything that has happened in the last decade or 20 years or 100 right. years. This goes way, way back. Let's go back to Iran for just a second. Let's get all of this in, in perspective. Where in scripture do I need to pay attention? And we've talked about this a lot, but the geopolitical aspect of this, where does Iran find itself? If Iran has all this influence and Iran has all this money and all this power, right. where does Iran find itself, especially when we're talking about eschatology in the end times, where does Iran find itself in scripture? Well, the main thing is that when you go to look up Iran in your biblical concordance, you're not going to find that. Right. But you will find this word Persia. Yes, sir. And so Iran is Persia. And what a lot of people watching today are having a discussion in their small group or their Sunday school class or their Wednesday night Bible studies is that 
they don't realize that Iran is not an Arab nation. Right. They're not even Arabs. They're Persians. And they're very proud of that fact. And so what you find is that biblical Persia is in the prophecies of the book of Ezekiel. Right. And it says, as we approach the end time and the coming of a Jewish Messiah born in a Jewish country right. with a Jewish virgin mother and a Jewish stepfather on planet Earth who did his ministry around a Jewish community at Galilee and gave his last teachings and life in this town right behind us. Right. We can almost throw a rock to where he gave his life and where this Jewish Messiah, he's not coming back to a Gentile nation, a Gentile city, a Gentile community. He's coming back home. He's coming back. And, and have you ever gotten this far out of all the world, out of all the continents, out of all the cities? Why did God pick Jerusalem? Yes, sir. He picked this place. It, you, can't, you can't escape. We, we had a, a, a Jamaican lady rescue us this morning in New York City when we were trying to go through, through the maze of lines to get to here. And we told her we are going to Jerusalem. And what did she tell us? What did she call this city? The God City. She said, oh, it's the God City. You will be fine. God will watch over you. She was all excited. We're going to the God City. The whole world right. knows it's the God right. City. And the, and the implications for everything that's taking place, if you look at the Battle of Gog and Magog, things that have to happen in the future, right? You would, you, it's hard to put all of those alliances in place that the Bible talks about, but those alliances are in place between the Russians and the, the Iranians and even the Turks, who all play a part of that. All of these things are, are galvanizing together. They're becoming reality. It's not it's not even a, a matter of probability anymore. And we talked about this a little bit earlier, but all the things that we're talking about, we're, we're, we're able to see now how it's possible, how it's going to come to fruition. Right. We even see that the possibility of the Antichrist having something to do with the current conflict is a possibility. Right. The Battle of Gog and Magog, those alliances that have to, be take, that have to take place, they're formed. Uh, some of them still are to be formed, but we can see how even Russia uh, becoming friendly with African nations, how that will have implication. Uh, but it's incredible to see that things we've talked about since I was a child right. are becoming reality. Things that you've talked about since you were a teenager, you were born in 1947. 47. I was born in 1990. Mm -hmm. Poppy was born in 1919. Poppy right. was saved in 1937. Right. When Poppy began to preach, Poppy had to preach by faith. And I've talked about this from the pulpit of right. Trinity a lot. He had to preach by faith that Israel would be a nation. Right. So we, we forget that sometimes. 1948 is when Israel became a nation again, yeah, a rebirth of a nation. The night Poppy got saved, there was an Irish evangelist preaching named William McBurney. Right. Under a tent, by the way. And he used a chalkboard. He was a visual preacher, and, and you and I both like that kind yes. of teaching. And he was preaching that the, the whole message was to prove that the Bible is the Word of God. God's going to give Israel a, a, a home. He's going to give them a, a nation. They will live again. For 2,000 years, there's no Israel. Since Titus took Jerusalem, it's gone. Yes, sir. And this Irish evangelist with the authority of his Bible says, Israel will go home. Yeah. And they begin to quote scriptures, how they're gonna come home. My dad worked for a Jew that clicked in his head. He stayed after service to say, does that mean Jews have to know Jesus? Does, does that mean that the, and he said, Ralph, you're not saved by orthodoxy. You're not saved by candles or confessions. It's relationship, right? And everybody, no matter what religion or background they are, they've got to have this relationship with God's Son. And he said, and to prove that the Bible's real, God's going to give the Jews a homeland. And that, it, and that man preached 11 years before Israel becomes a nation. 
that it's going to happen. Right. And my dad gets saved. Yes, sir. And so you and I are seeing the fulfillment of the prophecies that are in the Word of God like never before. And you know, I've had a lot of wonderful experiences with governments and our government, the Israeli government and other nations that I've never mentioned anything about publicly. God's allowed me to see, understand and to travel and to be a part of things that I never dreamed would happen. And one thing that only a few people even know is when this activity be began to develop with the Abrahamic Accords and it began to build with the Saudis and, and what was happening in America, is it possible that we can say we will solve this problem when we're one? I'm talking about in peace, the Saudis. And one of the reports that I read was that there were 19 Arab nations ready to come in behind the Saudis. Yes, Did you sir. see that? Oh, yeah. That if that happened, that they normalize. They're not talking about hugs and kisses. We're talking about normalization. Commerce. Commerce. Trade. Trade. Yes. Airplanes going back and forth. And, and we went all the way to Abu Dhabi. And we went to what? The Israeli display in an Arab country to understand that they were beginning to shake this hand of normalization. Right. They allowed them to be represented at the World's Fair at, at, at the Expo. They did. Yeah. And so we went there because it was prophetic. We wanted to understand. But something happened that very few people know about. You know about it. but. There was a trip made in an unmarked airplane where we had a meeting with some people from the business world and with Jared. And, and we're sitting there talking. And all of this was a precursor. How will the evangelicals respond? Right. What will happen if we reach out and make a treaty? And then the president was gotten on the phone. All of that was a setup to what? We know that there's a Sunni and a Shia. And how can we get them to be able to ha have either a static relationship or that we stop the hate and violence relationship and if nothing more than to better their children and their grandchildren, right. that they at least shake a hand. Right. And all of that happened before the Abrahamic Accords. Right. And so what you observed was so vital to see that what we're sitting in here tonight, that maybe Iran became very nervous. Obviously. Obviously, that Israel's going to become friends with the uh, Arab world. Right. And leave, and leave not only the Palestinian resistance behind, but leave the, the, Irani, the Iranian regime behind uh, in normalizing relationships with all those those Arab countries and putting political pressure from their own people back on the leadership in Iran because obviously there are things happening there that have not happened since the revolution. No, and so it's a it's a volatile world. Let's let's go back to the war that's taking place so we have a little bit better understanding how we got here. Everything that was taking place with the Abraham Accords, everything that was taking place with even Palestinian resistance feeling completely cut off, how do I as a Christian take everything in that's happened? What is my response? What is my duty as a, as a saved, born again Bible believer? I'm not talking about Baptist. I'm not talking about independent Baptist, Southern Baptist. What is my duty as a Bible believing Christian who's right. led by the Holy Spirit of God? What is my response to the war in Gaza? Okay. Obviously I want to support Israel. I want to pray for Israel. Right. But what? how do I respond to, to the, the, the terrible realities of war? Right. How do I, how do I put all of that together and, and represent Christ in a biblical manner? I had a man call me from another state uh, while I was driving. I think I was headed to Noonan, Georgia to preach. Uh, and he said, I'm confused. How do we stand with Israel? 
when they are not Christians. That was his first part. And then the second part, when their army is bigger than the Hamas army, quote unquote. And, and my answer to him was Talking this. Talking about their military might. Their military might. And I said, what you need to remember is that there are Palestinians who, by the millions, that n didn't want this war. Oh, yes. That there is an army that is ruling and reigning underground. Right. Uh, to get it in perspective, New York City's got about, about 300 miles of underground subway tunnels, and there's that much in Hamas uh, controlled tunnels in Gaza. Plus, they just found a six mile tunnel from one part of central Gaza all the way down to the hospital. Went from the university to the hospital, six miles underground. You could drive a golf cart down through it. And so those people up on top are wanting to live, have a family, watch TV, make coffee, and, and go down to fish at the ocean. They didn't want this. And the people in Israel that didn't want this they had no desire for war. They were innocent. So where do we handle this as a Bible believer? How, where, where do we show the love of Christ? How do we become the peacemakers? Right. Those are things. And in America, we've had uh, one of the social networks really be anti-Israel, anti-Jewish. TikTok has really stepped up the heat of misinformation. And as you know, uh, February the 1st, I changed the focus of what we were trying to do uh, with helping equipment and stuff. We're all understanding that Abraham's got two children. He's got Ishmael and Isaac. And we're trying to help the Jewish people that are suffering with medical aid. And we're also trying to help the Palestinians. Sure. And we've done that for decades. And we're still doing that. And so what did we find out? That when this war breaks out, there's pain and suffering on both sides. Sure. Innocent people have obviously, the massacre of October 7th, I, I, I can't even tell you some of the things we've seen in country. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. Uh, but we do know this much, that when war breaks out, there's innocent people, and sometimes innocent people are put in harm's way. So someone gets killed, a child, on both sides of the border. So how do we negotiate that? How do we handle that? Well, one of the things I've always put into my mind is that God gives us a mandate that we would try to do good to all men and that we would be caring and we would be loving. And also, he even said in the word for us to pray for the peace of this city. Right. Isn't that something? Yes, sir. He said, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Now, help me with this. He didn't say pray for the peace of Rome. He didn't say pray for the peace of Berlin right. or London or New York or L.A. One city, right. Jerusalem. The name on which his city is written. He attached himself. Yes, sir. This is his, the place. The, the heart of God placed in a geographic location, this city. Yes, sir. The old rabbis I studied with, they told me that this is where he stood to do creation. Sure. On the foundation stone. Right. He spoke from there and said to his son, speak it. <laughs> Make it. And create it. Yes, sir. So how do we explain all this? Part of this I'm going to hang up in the closet of some things are a mystery. Yes, sir. And I'll never know till I get home to heaven. Sure. But I'll trust God while I'm here. And I'll trust his word. And I will try to do what Christ would want me to do. And that's to show my love and compassion right. for every man. I think people are feeling tension between the teachings of the Lord Jesus where he says to be the peacemaker, to love peace, to want to have peace. And, and maybe are somehow mistaking that for pacifism. Yeah. Israel has the right to defend itself. That's a biblical mandate. We biblical are to provide mandate. safety for our families, our children, our wives. Right. Uh, obviously, we want there to be peace. We also want the 134 hostages that still remain in those tunnels to be returned. 
Right. Um, and obviously that's going to take military action. We weep for anyone who loses their life, uh, who number one, doesn't know the Lord Jesus Christ, and number two, uh, who is a senseless loss of life. Right. Uh, it's one thing for militaries, you know, armies in, in, in uniform to go at it right. and, and to be in conflict and to be in battle. What Hamas did on October 7th has unlocked this atrocious, atrocious war. Um, and I, I personally, and I think you would agree with me, I laid the, the, the blame at their feet. You e have to. Every child that's been killed in Gaza, every innocent person who was used as a human shield, uh, every person where, where, a, where a bomb strayed. Yep. It's going to happen. It's war. The old adage of folks who have been in war is that war is hell. Yeah. And it's terrible. And so, of course, we pray for those people and we want it to end, uh, but we need it to end the right way uh, for the sake of security and for there to be a measure of peace. And, and, I, and you and I talked about this earlier today. It brings to, to reality, to light, the fact that no matter what happens, if Israel marches in, in Gaza for the next two years and removes every sympathetic operative of Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad right, and rid them of this earth, there will still be pressure, there will still be tension, right. there will still be the Jew versus the Arab, Muslims versus Jews, it, it will still be there. You can even go one step further. If there was no Israel and if there were no Jews, there would still be the Sunni Muslim right. and the Shia Muslim. You'd still have Saudi Arabia, you'd still have Iran, and you'd still have war. Free and fair elections are not going to fix the problem. That's not it. It gives us cause to stop and to realize how true our Bible is when it says that there will be no real peace realized right. until the Prince of Peace comes. And I, I, I am challenged today. It's it, this is a heavy, heavy trip for us. Yep. Uh, because we have friends that we love and that we care for and we want to see peace. Uh, but there's so much to be said here and I'm thankful that God's given us the opportunity to have this conversation and to have it with, with uh, we're, we're not trying to, to change opinion. No. We're just simply looking at what we're seeing, what the Word of God says and how we as Christians, as Bible believers and, and as Americans, right. uh, how we respond to all this. One thing that I want to uh, reiterate, if I may, is the fact that we are not trying to uh, present a point of view f for my personal opinion or, or your personal opinion. We're trying to say, can we give you some more information and talk to you more about the Word of God? Right. As you said, we're not political scientists. We no. are Bible teachers, Bible preachers, called men of God to teach and preach the Word of God and to do so with as, with as many tools and all the capabilities that God gives us and to share what we're seeing, the, the, the first-hand accounts of folks that we know here and that we love here, right. and then to encourage the church to be the church. Yeah, and that, that businessman that called me from out of state, he would not have had those two questions if he had had Bible teaching, right. Bible instruction. And, and that's what we're trying to do. If we could go do a goal for 2024 and 2025, it'd be for you to get in the Word of God and the Word of God to get into you Amen. like never before because this is exciting. And, you know, I could go on for another hour or two. We've got to end this segment right now. But I, I want to just tell you, I want to thank you for, number one, praying. I want to thank you for investing in us that we can ab able to do these trips and then uh, if I could, could I encourage you to uh, be a part of what God's doing as we try to take and help in what I call the second war. And that is Israel's in a physical war, but there's also a war of words. I nicknamed it the smokeless battlefield that we're going to try to bring that. And part of the programming you're going to see over the next few weeks and months we're going to film it here. We're going to we're going to give you firsthand. But I want to thank you from my heart for those love and prayers. Pastor Winston, would you take us down to the end of this part of our discussion and 
and sort of summarize what we're trying to do and maybe where we're headed the next time we're together. Absolutely. So if you're enjoying this content, if you want to be a part of this discussion, especially if you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, make sure you're subscribed to the YouTube channel that you like and follow the Facebook page. That way, as this content becomes available, as he said, over the next few weeks and maybe even the next few months, that you don't miss a single segment. Make sure you're praying each and every day for God to open your eyes to reveal the truth of his word in your heart and your life. And may all of this content that we're shooting be a blessing to you, your family, your Sunday school class, your church. And uh, we're thankful for the opportunity that God's given us to be here in Israel together. 150 days of war with a biblical perspective as we search the land, talk Amen. to the people. And we're thankful for you. God bless you. Good morning and welcome to Serot. I'm Winston Parrish. I'm here with Pastor Ralph. We're here at the MDA station in the city. We're here with our friend Ophir Tor, and uh, we're thankful for the opportunity to be here today. Pastor Ralph, this is a, a surreal moment to be here inside the city and uh, to be here with you and to be here with our new friend, our good friend Jonathan from the Jerusalem station. And uh, we're thankful for the opportunity that we have today. It's, it's amazing and a lot of you have uh helped us bridge this gap of understanding and you have given generously that we can buy equipment and you can see the yard is full of equipment and you were here when all of this happened and I've already met people that have connection all the way back to the six day war uh, since we've been on the ground and, and then there's still this trouble brewing today and what's happening and Thank you for allowing us to come in. I, I feel almost like we're intruding on sacred ground because the street right behind Andrew, there were people that lost their lives. And this is a, a horrible thing. But what we're up against in America is a lot of people have put on social network that are anti-Jewish, anti-Semitic, that it didn't happen. It was a Hollywood production. But obviously it did happen. And can you share a little bit with us? Uh, sure. So, uh, as I said, uh, my name is Ophir Tor, and I'm actually stationed in this. I'm stationed in this station, is the uh. road station, as a volunteer medic. Okay. So this is not my work. I just go for shifts, as I can, and I volunteer. Sure. Uh, you know, for the good of humanity. Seventh uh, of October was a very uh, Saturday morning. Mm -hmm. Saturday morning, uh, this is a small town, nothing happens here, Saturday, everybody's asleep at 7 in the morning Saturday. Shift, we, we change shift at 7 in the morning. Mm -hmm. 7 in the morning, we have two teams here, two ambulances just on alert. And normally there's nothing happening, unless there's some kind of an accident. But normally there's nothing. Normally nothing happens. So, I was... Uh, I plan to, to take the morning shift on seven, 7 in the morning, uh, Saturday. And as I was driving from home over here, uh, actually at 6.30 we started getting bombardments. Okay? Uh, so... And when you say bombardments, you're talking about rockets from Gaza? The rockets from Gaza, uh, massive amounts of rockets from Gaza at 6.30 in the morning. And we're, and we're just about three miles from Gaza from here? Uh, yeah, from, from, from the actual uh, fence with the border? No, less. Less than three miles. Oh, yeah, much less. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, basically what happened is um, I woke up at 6.30 and I was rushed because I was late. You know, normally we come earlier to, you know, to change shift, to count the bandages, if there were anything, you know, yeah, to make yeah. sure that all the equipment is, you know, uh, is there, you know, uh, and uh, and we like to have, you know, uh, uh, some kind of uh, conversation with the other team that we're changing. They fill us in, you know. Not everything is written down, 
Uh, so I was late. And that probably what saved my life, by the way. Probably saved your life probably. being late. Yeah, yeah. That, so don't, don't take it as... <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes uh, being late saves your life. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but that's an amazing statement that, yeah, that yeah. it was that close in time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you're telling me that the providence of, of God was that that little bit of time saved your life. That's yeah, amazing. well, there were a lot of uh, right uh, miracles with me at this, ah. uh, this uh, day. And not w only with me, with this station as well. Okay, because uh, later on we learned from the intelligence uh, agencies that we were actually targeted as one of the uh, places to uh, by the terrorists to uh, eradicate. So Hamas, Hamas had it on their planned maps in the yeah. attack yeah. that this station where we're standing would be one of the places they would infiltrate and, and, and station themselves in the attack of the city. Uh, exactly. So, uh, so now, <clears throat> generally speaking, we have two ambulances here on alert, and we have this one. This is an old, an old she. We call her the she. Right. And she is, I don't know, 30, 35 years old. I don't know, uh, but she's the only armored vehicle we have, and we didn't know that we can even fire her up uh, that morning. So right. we didn't. Uh, seven in the morning. Right bombardments, I'm rushing to the station, and uh, uh, I'll take you there and you'll see. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, but over here what happened was that the team was caught just, uh, I think there were, um, there were four of them. I was, I was on my way, the other team was already here, and uh, we started getting injured in. Uh, two of them, uh, chest wounds, mm. okay. I was already over here. We started making uh, surgical procedures inside, uh, but this, mind you, is not a hospital. There's nothing inside. It's just, uh, have you been inside? Did I've you been know? inside, yeah. It's, uh, it's just it's like a, a fire station, a break room, a TV, coffee maker, exactly. and exactly. the restrooms. Uh, exactly. So that's, it became a surgery it. center all October right. the 7th. Right. So, um, Later on, what you see over here, we had 40 buddies lined up that we put them over here because the ambulances came during the, the course of the day, okay? Yeah. Coming in. So in this parking area? In this parking area, we put them one beside the other. We lined them up, 40 different, uh, 40, uh, uh, 40 dead people. And every time the ambulance would come in, we'd unload, we'd take the stretchers, and we would uh, wash the stretches from blood. Uh, when we say, when I say we, over here, you see the hose? Yeah. Over here, I would wash the blood of, over here, give it back to the ambulance, go get, fetch the other ones. And go get another one. Yeah, but we only had this old lady over here and she could barely fire her, we could barely fire her up because we had, the, every ambulance that went out, didn't come back or came back uh, with wounded or uh, dead. We're, we are understaffed, so you know, you're just working on adrenaline, you know. Yes. Uh, I was the one that uh, made a makeshift uh, field hospital over here, okay. Uh, we, I took the furniture and everything out. Right. I mean, there's only me, there's nobody else, so okay. So you gotta do what you so gotta you do. you gotta do. Over there we have a shed, that kind of a container over there. Yeah. We have just, uh, you know, these army, not army, these stretcher beds, and army beds kind of a thing, you know. You know, so I just opened it up, started lining up the beds, took equipments from the ambulances that were here that we could use. Right. Okay, uh, like monitors and stuff. Made one ALS, advanced life saving. Okay, one room, and the other one I did a BLS, okay, a room, so that we can direct who's who and, uh, and what's what and to, in order to have an organized kind of a procedure. What type uh, of injuries were you seeing? Uh, chest wounds, uh, leg wounds, uh, anything, everything, you know. At this point, is this from rocket barrage or is this from gunfire? No, mostly terrorists? gunfire. Okay. Terrorist RPGs. Uh, and, uh, well, we didn't get any RPG hits. I mean, uh, people that were injured by the RPG, normally they wouldn't su survive it, but uh, chest wounds, uh, leg wounds, the, the, uh, the uh, girl from the police, the police, uh, police woman that was over here, 
with the legs, uh, chest wounds. Uh, in, uh, we did uh, trocar, you know, trocar to, to, for the blood, uh, to get the blood and air out of the lungs. Yes, okay, all these maneuvers and procedures we did right yeah. over there. So what, what I'm understanding is it's an unbelievable pressure. You just, you're just so overwhelmed that you just had to go into almost I'm not even going to think about what I'm seeing, but I'm just going to try to help. You're, you're opening an ambulance door, doing triage. This one may live. Let's get them inside. This one didn't live. Let's put them here. Watch the stretcher. Give it to the paramedic and let him go back out. Exactly. Unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so this was uh, slowly. Uh, a lot of the team came in because not because they were on a shift that they heard. So the natural thing would be that uh, a lot of uh, the paramedics, okay, and medics uh, living in the vicinity, just uh, dodged the bullets arriving at the station to help out. Yeah. Don't forget, phone systems were down because the masses of, we couldn't get to the emergency, to the police, nothing, because the, the system was overwhelmed and just crashed. Yeah. Okay, and uh, now we had one pistol, one, one handgun, pistol. one handgun, which wasn't even as good as my one, uh, and that's all we had to defend. This is the back entrance for the ambulances, okay? But th we use it as the main door, okay? okay. So over here, we had, uh, they took off the sign. I put the sign BLS so they'll know. All this was I threw out to the garden, put uh, stretchers over here. That was uh, BLS, basic life saving, okay? Right here. Right here. So the break room became a, a field hospital. Yeah. That you could do basic life saving right here. Right over before here. Before you transport them. Right. At the beginning, the first wounded, we just we, everything was it was even more packed than here. Oh, we had the big table. I, I don't know where. So this was really packed. More furniture was here. So actually, over here, we treated uh, the first uh, wounded with the. Uh, uh, with the chest injury over here, uh -huh. we saved him, by the way. Oh, oh yeah, wow. and um, and he was full of blood everywhere. And then I was helping uh, me and another paramedic. And then he says, "Oh, look, this is this is big. Go and fix the uh, do a field hospital. Uh, I'll, I'll I'm over I'm already okay over here. I can finish it off. Nice. You go and do it." So. There you was started two, to work. There was two of us. I yeah. understand what's happening. Okay, so I started getting over here. Over here, I went, and uh, this is uh, the safe room over here. See this door? This is this is a uh, so this is your safe bomb room. shelter. This is my our bomb, sh bomb shelter. Yeah. Yeah. So over here, I took everything out. Stretches over here. That was the ALS, Advanced Life Saving. And right wow. here. Yeah, so that was uh, here, and became full very fast. Oh, so let, let, let's go back for just a second. You're a volunteer paramedic. You yeah. have a very successful, you're highly educated, you've lived in London, you volunteer, this is your people, your heart, your home. I, as, a, as a former paramedic, always have that heart. I want to go back to your training. How wonderful is it that you were able to have the training every class that you paid attention to, every trauma resource center you ever went to, learning how to do sucking chest wounds, learning how to do chest decompressions, learning about how the body responds to trauma. As a paramedic, I wanna thank you. I wanna thank you for paying attention to your training, to listening to your training. Give you saved lives. That's, that's, that's incredible. That, that's what we're all about. It's right? incredible. Yeah. It's that's the, it's the training about. that and paid because off. because of your heart, like you said, you're a volunteer paramedic. Yeah. Oh yeah, it brings tears to my you eyes. Have, you have a a very safe, comfortable life with all that you've been blessed with, and yet you come and invest yourself in others, and we admire you for that. We you can never you. pay back a paramedic in money what he's worth, huh. but every life that you saved on October the seventh and afterwards, that is your payday. That is your reward. Exactly. Every life that lives, exactly. and whether it's Jewish blood, Christian blood, Muslim blood, it exactly. doesn't matter. Yeah. You're a paramedic there to save people. Right. And we appreciate you. I stopped over here in order to hear the sirens, and all of a sudden I hear gunshots. Now, gunshots, you know, uh, bombardments, that's one thing. Gunshots, yeah. that means there's infiltration. Somebody's right. here. I'm over here. And I'm getting out because I'm low. I'm trying to figure out what's going on. Where, where, so where's the gunshot? Your vehicle's coming? here. Yeah. 
My vehicle's right here. I stopped yeah. right over here. And I'm trying to see what's going on. And I see a bunch of uh, men across the, uh, between the trees there. I see a bunch of men. They were terrorists. Hamas right there. Yeah, and I thought, well, so now they had AK-47s. So, I'm running over here. This is Saturday morning. Most of, uh, there was a van, where the van over there, there was a van there, but all this was empty. I was running over here. My phone, everything was in the car. I can't alert the cavalry. I can't do anything, okay? I don't have a handgun. I said, anybody that's coming down over here is going to be shot dead. So I returned. As I'm returning, a car uh, drives over there and I'm kind of heading it towards me, okay? I didn't know it was a woman. It was a woman inside right. the car. She saw me. She saw them shooting at her. So she made this turn over here. She followed my, my gestures. Right. And she came. There was there. There was a woman and a teenager with uh -huh. her. And uh, she wanted to stop. I said, go continue to the end. They're after us. And uh, she didn't want to leave the car. And I, I made her open the door took her by force from the car, say, run. You run this direction, you run over. Right. Then they see me, they, then they turned, of course, they caught up with you, but they And they caught and they see me again, so they shoot at me twice. So I was shot twice by them. While I was running over there looking for a phone, okay, uh, another vehicle came down this road and they shot an RPG at him. They hit him. Actually, from the RPG, he wasn't killed. Uh, after a few seconds, he kind of, he was, he's, he's from the fire department. So he kind of got out of the car, made a noise, they turned on him, shot him. And then when, uh, after they shot him, they knifed him. And uh, this I didn't see happening, but when I came back and looked, I saw the, uh, the car after the RPG was hit. All, the, all this is a matter of, you know, 10 minutes. Uh, the whole, the whole thing scenario okay right so I was running back down and then I saw the massacre that happened to the uh, senior citizens by the, uh, the station now as a paramedic what you what you do is you go uh, when you see you go to check your pulse yeah and this is an instinct right so uh, as I approached that building I I said, oh, I need to see if, if I can, if somebody's alive. Right. And then when I went to check the pulse, I saw that this is gruesome. Uh, he had half a head. Obviously, he can't have a pulse. They fired with fury. With. Uh, so it just wasn't one shot. No, no, no. Execute. They just kept on and kept on. And this we saw all the uh, every all this road. They just kept on firing and firing. It was like with rage. Mutilation of Mutilation, the yeah. So I'm walking over here. The Berlingo, that uh, commercial car, had two, uh, two people inside it. These, two, these are the two from, from earlier that Hamas earlier, killed. Yeah. Right before, before, they, before, they, shooting before they shot at me, yeah. And the uh, car just uh, kind of slid and hit that tree slowly. And they were just here. Uh, they were outside, uh, headless almost. And then I understood the magnitude of the, the of the rage that they, these people had. Okay, they came with a pickup, a white Toyota pickup. Eleven of them, the terrorists. They saw the elderly. They disembarked. By the way, they came one minute before me. One minute before you. The terrorists arrived. We see from the pictures. From the pictures, from the uh, from the cameras, one minute before me they came. Just uh, so, like you see, they're standing here. 13, 13 of them were here, and they just shot at them, just point blank, just like that. They disembarked from the Toyota over there, roughly uh, just before that white uh, Nissan over there, whatever yeah. it is. Okay, and disembarked. They just came and just shot them, like so, right here. This is, this is the place that made national news, international news. This is the place where those 13 senior citizens who were going, pensioners as I, as I see them called in Israeli media, going to the Dead Sea for a day of rest. They're just standing at the bus stop. 
like you know? these ladies here for today. And for no reason other than being here, they executed them. Yeah, they just executed them. Exactly, that's the way. You know, uh, being ex-military, you know, I consider my, myself an officer sure. and a gentleman. I would never do, I would never kill for the sake of killing. I would shoot for protection. Or to be the, or to mutilate a dead body. You've already killed a mother person, right? Exactly. And then just to keep, you know, I told a, a news reporter in the United States uh, that if, you know, I'm obviously an, a minister and I believe in the, the Bible, I believe in Jehovah and the Word of God, and there's a good and evil. And I said, there's a darkness that came out of Gaza that, that I can't explain it. I'd use the word demonic because it's not normal, it's not natural, it's not pure evil. It's pure, dark evil. Pure. By all probabilities of fear, you should not be standing here talking to us today, talking to the thousands of people in the United States that are watching today. And for all that you've shared and how you've opened up to us today, the tour of the station, really reliving a little bit of that with us. It's given us a better insight. We are forever, forever grateful that you would be willing to open up that part of your heart and to give us the details. And our heart is to take this back to the United States, our friends all over the world that watch our content and that your story would be heard. Yep. And uh, I know this, I pastor some of the one most wonderful people in, in all of the world, in my opinion. I, I've met a lot of people, they're good people. And when they get your name, Ophir, I, I can make you this promise. Our people will pray for you every day. Every they will day. pray for, for the for peace of this city yeah. and, and for your well-being going forward because it is a lot. We're both, I, I'm a former paramedic. You're a, a retired army officer, a paratrooper, still a paramedic, all that you do. And you know and I know that there is months and years of processing. You can't see all that your eyes have seen and simply stuff it away into a box. And, and so we are with you for the long haul. And uh, I hope maybe one day we can bring a, a, a few more friends and we can talk and, and celebrate life together. Because from now on, every day, every footstep that you take, every breath that you breathe is a gift from God. And uh, I'm thankful that I got to meet you today. And uh, we're honored to be here in Serdot with you. We really are. God bless you. We thank you for your leadership. Thank you. And we thank you for your kindness. Welcome back to Southern Israel. We're in the community of Kuma and we're looking at all of the vehicles that have been collected from the October 7th massacre. There are vehicles not only of residents that lived in the surrounding areas and kibbutz, but also the vehicles used by Hamas on that fateful day. Right behind me, there's a red car. And this red car was owned by one of the police officers who responded to the massacre that day. He was shot and killed in his car. Right behind that vehicle is a white truck. We'll go to that truck in a moment. That's one of the very trucks used by Hamas, a machine gun mounted to the back that was used in the attacks. There's tractors over here that were brought from Gaza. We'll show you all of this. Pastor Ralph's here with me. Andrew's behind the camera. We have our good friend Jonathan Yagodowski from MDA, who's our host. And we're taking in something that is quite emotional. I'm, I'm trying yeah. my best to keep composure. We'll cry later. Uh, we've seen ambulances that were hit by RPGs police vehicles right here beside Andrew that were hit by RPGs. Well, as we're standing here, you know, we, we think of seeing someone shoot a gun in their backyard or target practice, but you can't imagine the energy or the impact of a round to come into a vehicle. And look at the roof, just the energy of that explosion, it ripped right, I mean, it just opened it like a can opener. And then the people that are inside, they, they perish. And uh, the reason all the cars you're seeing that are brownish are rusting is because there was fire, there was heat. The ones that didn't burn are here. Uh, but it, all of those that were involved with, with the actual explosion and the fire. And, and look at the motor blocks. I mean, they melted with the intensity. And you can see them stacked up here all along the, they just made a wall 
uh, of the carnage. We've we've seen hurricanes, right? Tornadoes. You went to the bombings in Oklahoma, Oklahoma City, New York City, New York City, 9/11, World Trade Center. This this is such a different attack on so many different levels. Yeah, and there's a lot to say. But thank you for joining us. We have a lot more to reveal, a lot more to show. We have just a few days here to to capture all that needs to be captured. But thank you for following us and joining us. And we just mentioned a moment ago the ambulance, and I neglected to mention how people that if God's touching their heart, or if their business or civic group or synagogue or church wants to help us, help the people, how do they stay in touch with us? RalphSexton.com is always the best way to do so. You can give securely online. Maybe your business, your church, your school wants to purchase an ambulance. You can do so securely online. You can call the office there. All of that information is available at RalphSexton.com. We're also on YouTube. We're on Facebook. Find us Ralph Sexton Ministries. Make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel or much of this content will be coming to and to our Facebook page, Ralph Sexton Ministries. And if they want to honor a loved one, if, if a church wants to honor their pastor, a school wants to honor a principal, right. or you want to honor a legislature in your community, we'll, we'll show you how. Right. That their name can be on the door and of uh, the equipment that's donated, whether it's a medical motorcycle or an ambulance, and, and you can have that honor for your people. Absolutely. We're in Southern Israel. Thank you for joining us. There'll be more to come. Uh, several people have been asking the question, how can there be an attack like this happens so fast. How can uh, the uh, terrorists come from Gaza and come swooping into the villages with so much death and devastation? Well, number one, remember it happened on a high holy day uh, when all the cell phones and the internet and the radio's off. Then secondly, in a moment, Andrew's gonna show you one of the tractors. And what they would do is they'd take an RPG and they would shoot the cell tower and then they would shoot the cameras and then they would take tractors that they had in Gaza and run them into the fence, lift the fence up, and then these would come scooting under the fence or, or in the breach that had been made. And you can see here on the back, this is homemade, but it's very effective because you put a machine gun up on top like a, a 30 caliber machine gun. And even though this part is homemade, bolted to the bed of this truck, but then it becomes a, a lethal killing machine and uh, a 50 caliber machine gun up here on top. And then you're talking about a round that can uh, uh, explode and take out vehicles and armament. So this is just one of the tools of the preparation that was made uh, when October 7th occurred. Andrew's gonna turn the camera around and uh, Winston, would you show them the, uh, please the tractor? and how they would uh, partner this up with having the things of the fence breached, cell towers, and all that were taken out on the alarm system. Remember, there's three fences that had to be breached. And so when they took the RPGs, they took the cell tower, they took the alarm system, and then there was no warning. And now Pastor Winston's at the tractor, and that was the integral part to taking out the uh, fence and coming into the kibbutz. I wanted to give you just a quick glimpse of something that maybe you saw on the news on the day of October the 7th. One tool that Hamas used to infiltrate Israel to come into these communities and to kill, to maim, and to kidnap were tractors. Uh, explosive devices were placed on the fence. Those fences were, were blown up in small sections, multiple places all along the Gaza Strip. And then tractors were brought to push pieces and chunks of that wall open so that hundreds of terrorists could infiltrate the kibbutzes and the communities and carry out the atrocities. Here in front of you is one of the tractors that was used to cause harm. You can see the front end of it's been destroyed. Uh, we're told by the people here that oversee the over 1,200 damaged vehicles here. Some are Israeli citizens who are running away. Some were used by Hamas, the white car that's behind me. And this tractor are examples of what was used to carry out the attack. Uh, quite, quite a lot to say about what we see here, what we feel here. And uh, no doubt it's something for us to all remember. But what a terrible day it was. More evidence of the atrocities of Hamas. We're here in Southern Israel. And as you can hear in the background, 
there's still the rumbling of artillery and tank fire. We're only three kilometers from the war zone, the border of Gaza. But I wanted to tell you something before we leave. If you would see this stack of cars and you see how there's one under here, then two, then three, then four, then five, then six, then seven, then eight, and then there's, it just goes forever. Andrew was showing you a moment ago how wide it is. Every single car represents a man or a woman, a husband and a wife, a family, an SUV with children. And sometimes we see a, a memorial like this with all the carnage. And all these are ones that burn. The big field with, they're still put together with paint. Those didn't burn. They have bullet holes. But these all caught on fire. They burn. And every one of them represents a family who was alive, an individual. Over 1,300 people died that day right here in southern Israel. Thank you for standing with us, and thank you for standing with the nation of Israel as we help them contend and we try to help in the smokeless battle of defeating the lie. Thank you for joining us again today. We're in southern Israel. We're right up against the Gaza border as we've been doing all day today. We've been traveling, interviewing people, what happened on October the 7th, documenting that it really happened. So much liberal media, even talking heads and TV programs are saying, well, we think maybe it wasn't as bad as it's being explained or it was over uh, with much drama and uh, some even outright said it was Hollywood actors mm. and it was all fake. Uh, I'm with Pastor Winston Parrish. We're standing here in the Nova Music Festival. You can hear the outgoing rounds from the Israeli army. We're in this war zone today, but I know that a lot of people died in this field and yes, sir. all these trees behind us, the, each one of them represents a person and the army's been down here to honor even its own people bring our people up to date and a little bit about what's happened. So as he said, we are uh, very close to the Gaza border. You just heard a, a moment ago howitzer cannons firing against Hamas terrorists in Gaza. And uh, we're here in a very important place. Uh, if you talk about October the 7th, you cannot talk about uh, October the 7th without mentioning the Supernova Music Festival that was taking place right here on this ground right. where we're standing. Uh, we're standing in a place where 364 people lost their lives. 31 people were kidnapped and taken to Gaza. And as of today, uh, five of those people have been released. Uh, this is a place of hurt. This is a place of pain. This is yep. a place of sorrow. And we've, uh, we've seen a lot today. We have a lot to process. We have a lot to talk about. Right. But let's go back. Tomorrow will be five months since October the 7th. That's correct. And at 6.30 in the morning on October the 7th, thousands of rockets were, were initiated with, with a really a level that Israel has not seen in a long time, maybe even ever. Maybe ever. Thousands of rockets throughout the day, but the barrage began at 6.30 in the morning. By 7 a.m., the first Hamas fighters were in this field. They uh, came right across. Remember now the, the stories and the video even of the paragliders uh, that brought the fighters in over the border a wall from Gaza into this field. Hundreds and thousands at that point of young people dancing and having a good time and uh, getting ready for the holiday. And by seven, Hamas fighters were in these fields, hiding behind these trees, using AK-47s, rocket propelled grenades, and shooting at innocent civilians uh, that were here for what should have been a good time. And uh, you can't imagine some of the stories that were told about people running for their lives, hiding in trenches and in ditches and in fields. We saw early to, earlier today 1,200 cars that are being processed by the Israeli government, uh, a forensic graveyard of all of the vehicles, many of them that left this very site. Young people trying to flee. Hamas is moving across this field towards the, the festival, which is over here uh, to my left. And there was just mayhem. This is yeah. a place of chaos, running, 
screaming, hiding, and every group of, uh, of young people that stopped, every little cluster that hid inside of a bomb shelter right outside the road, every group of young ladies uh, that hid behind the drink counter where you could get a Coke and an ice cream, uh, they were found in piles. Yep. Th th those first videos we saw uh, back on the 7th and the 8th showed absolute carnage. And it's hard to imagine uh, something like that happening in 2024. That's yeah. what we've talked about all day today. This isn't, it's not 1940. No. This is 2024. Yep. And uh, I, I told the gentleman in Kibbutz Berry today, I don't understand this. No. I, don't, I don't get it. I, my mind can't compute the hate and the willingness to, to massacre young women and young men uh, for for the sake of of either a, a religious ideology, whether it be Islamic Jihad, or whether it just be uh, someone so full of hate that they're willing to go beyond anything that seems human, as you've said, it's demonic activity. It is, and it, it's and it's an oppressive thing to see the number of of faces, young beautiful faces, who went out into eternity that day. And it's a sobering reminder it of is. why we have to tell this story. It's emotional. Uh, we, we will be processing today for a long time. We I, will. I've told you multiple times, I don't think I'll ever forget what, I, what I've seen and witnessed today. One of the things I think that's important for us to, to mention is why would we come? I, I told uh, one of the survivors this morning, I feel like I've invaded their privacy. I didn't want to talk to them. I felt like it was a sacred thing, you know, because well, the gentleman we just interviewed, his dad was uh, killed. But, and, uh, but their testimony is, we must tell you. We must tell. And yeah. the, his father's blood was on the wall. Right. And so we're here seeing it, we're understanding it, being able to uh, process this, that people at home that don't think it really happened or that there was uh, over, uh, that, you know, that Israel just made it up, Hollywood actors, all the lies that's being told in the liberal media. It happened. It happened, it's real. We've seen the blood on the walls. And you need to know it's real. You need to know what happened here and that we can uh, still contend with Israel, we can stand with Israel, we can help them. And uh, you know, it's not political at this point. It's good versus evil. It's, it's darkness and light. Yes, it's sir. good versus evil. and. Uh, how do you explain the, the atrocious, vicious, uh, that uh, you can, without any heart or passion, take some kids out of a, a bus uh, shelter and say, this girl's for putting in a tunnel in, in Gaza and this girl's for raping to death. And just like you're sorting cattle in a cattle yard. I, it, it's unbelievable. Well, we, we know this, there will be a reckoning. God saw everything that happened on October the 7th and God sees everything and he knows everything. Jehovah will see and understand all he, of it. He sees it all, he knows it all, and there will be a reckoning. Some of that reckoning is happening just a mile across this fence from where we're standing. And Hamas is being obliterated uh, piece by piece, battalion by battalion. Uh, some of the hostages have been recovered. There's still 134 hostages that must be recovered. And so our prayers are with these people and. Uh, it's our duty, it's our job as, as Bible believers, as Christians, to stand with our, our Jewish friends, our, our brothers and sisters, and uh, to continue to pray for peace, not only in Jerusalem, but in Israel. We're sort of in the main public area of the kibbutz. We have the dining room, the dining hall over there. Was there a plan to have Sukkot celebration in the dining hall? Yes, actually the day before and the day and the October 7th were celebrations of the kibbutz birthday. Oh wow. Yeah, so we were planning to have like a really big celebration on Saturday. And this area here uh, was the art gallery and the swing shop and the clothes shop of the kibbutz. 
it was all burned down to really ashes. The place here, it was really a monumental place because it was the old dining hall. It was a relic of the 50s and we hope we can uh, rebuild it again. And so this is the, the original image. dining hall, Yeah. the sewing shop where clothes were made? Yeah, the clothes uh, store actually and the sewing shop oh, next to it. Oh, there was a store here too. And, uh, and an art gallery right on the right side over here. Wow. Um, yeah, and also a small like store for toys and all the kinds of like kid toys and stuff uh, that they made here. Kids toys. Yeah, they made the, the elderly when they retire, they can do whatever they want. And they have like a place where you can come and like, you know, work and for a few hours. Have and some do, purpose. Yeah, have some purpose. Yeah. That's, Something you you always said about uh, someone who comes from the, like someone from a kibbutz is like when they stop working they stop living. Yeah. So right. And my father used to build um, toys for that store, wow. and unfortunately my father died during uh, the massacre on October seventh. Your father passed. I'm mm -hmm. so sorry. He, he was murdered there, and we will see during the tour. Uh, the place where he was last seen and we will see where he worked. This is part of my mission to share his story. What's your father's name? Mordechai Naveh. Mordechai Naveh. Yeah, and he was 76 years old. Wow. And really a man of, of hard work, you know, he worked in agriculture and construction. He managed a lot of those things, like he managed the construction of the kibbutz, saw a lot of uh, buildings that were made here, and this place was very important to him. So he was an integral part of the kibbutz and everything that it yeah. was becoming and developing. Yeah. And he lost his life on October the 7th. Yeah. I'm very sorry. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us. The story started at about 6.30 in the morning. There was a lot of rocket alarms, a lot of rockets fired at the kibbutz, at all the places in Israel, basically all the, from Tel Aviv to here. And that was a diversion during that attack of rockets. They infiltrated Israel by big, big numbers. I mean, 3,000 terrorists came into Israel. 3,000? During that day, 3,000 wow. came into Israel. Wow. About that. And we were in our bed at the time. Uh, our bed is in the safe room because uh, it's a small house. Yeah. One of the houses you see over there, that's, that's close to where I live. That's like next to it. And um, so at about seven, we got an alarm that there's terrorists in the kibbutz. The, we have a small unit um, of 12 uh, men. That day we had only 11. 11 men. 11 men to defend the whole kibbutz. To defend the whole kibbutz. The, the first response unit, uh, as they called. Yeah. And. They were really overwhelmed by about 300 That's or amazing. so yeah. terrorists that came in here. Yeah. Uh, it's the largest group of terrorists into any of the of the kibbutzim. And they knew where they were coming. They knew what they were doing. They came here on intent to terrorize, to make us fear them to butcher, to kill, to torture anyone they see. Uh -huh. they, if they went to a public place like the printing factory, uh -huh. they came in, they saw that, that nobody was there, they left. They didn't care. They care about the people. They came here to the houses and they wanted... So they weren't interested in vacant spaces, they were interested in the people. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. And the more intelligence you're getting now, from what I understand, is they're, you're getting their GoPros, you're hearing the conversation, 
Yes, this everything they recorded a lot of they recorded a lot of the, what they did here. Yeah, which is really why I don't understand how people can see it both ways. Like they were proud of what they did here. Yeah. Okay, so this area here is a educational area. You see kindergartens. Uh -huh. Two here. No. It's important to know these kindergartens were built as also rocket shelters. They're, they're basically they're dual purpose. a big safe room. So they knew, they had indication that these places are really strong. They came in here and used it as their basically command center. There are about a hundred terrorists in, this, in these buildings, in these three buildings over here. Four if you count that one. Um, they use it as a sort of command post. So when they came in here, there's no, uh, there's only 11 guys to defend the whole kibbutz. So they rolled in here. One of the places they immediately came is here. And because they... And so that gave them a temporary headquarters for the invasion of this part of Israel. Yes. Because yes. these were this fortified they, buildings and they yeah. knew about it. Yeah, exactly. And here, you'll see this is where my father used to work, yes. a carpentry. Uh, he made these, all these small toys for children. Uh, because of the damage in the battle, the massacre, they're going to tear this place apart. It's actually one of the oldest buildings, uh, this shed, one of the oldest buildings oh in the kibbutz. They have to tear it apart now. Um, Look at all the bullet holes and mortar rounds. That looks like an RPG hit that wall. Just maybe. Blew a hole. Maybe. Uh, yeah. There was a lot of, like, the IDF fought them here a lot. What are we coming to here, my friend? Okay, so, as I said, these are kindergartens. This is a kids club, after school kids club. And it was totally destroyed during the battle, they had to demolish it so it was too dangerous. So they had to like clear the wreckage here. But this was a house, just like that one, just like that one. It's just a big place where kids used to play and have fun after school. So the IDF had to demolish it to, to rid the terrorists out of the community that had held no, it was inside. it was they thought maybe it was booby trap oh, and wow. also it was like already like collapsing because they fought against the terrorists over here and just, you know, uh, with a tank that was here. So there was a lot of damage lot to of the damage. building. So your father, he worked up here where yeah. he showed us at the toy shop. Yeah. And then is this just a normal part of the neighborhood? Is this guy, does this? This is, again, this is an educational area. It's where kids go every day. Kindergartens, kids clubs, the library over there. After school, right here. Yeah, that's the kindergarten. That's the after school. After school. Uh, this is all damage from explosions, bullets, grenades, rocket launchers. Let's see the. Yeah. It's hard to imagine that many people storming against 11 security guys who are responsible to be the first response team. Yeah. And you have to This fight kind of scenario was never thought of no. in Israel. Didn't seem possible, did it? Yeah. Didn't seem possible. So this is the dentist's office, which was the designated uh, emergency infirmary. Um, what happened is some of the first response unit uh, members and some locals were injured. They had to bring them somewhere to treat them. Mm. And we have a paramedic and a nurse and a doctor who were there here with them, mm. also local. Um, so they called them early in the morning, told them to come here. This was the infirmary, so they wanted to treat the wounded here. They didn't know that a hundred terrorists are gonna be like 
hunkering down over there. Had no way of knowing. Yeah. So they came here waves after waves and they were able to hold them off for about, I think, six, seven, until 1, 2 p.m. Gosh. Six, seven hours My all goodness. alone. Two, two first response unit members and just doctor and nurse and a paramedic who were treating the wounded. Is it true what I've read, what happened here is that the two first response units that were here that had weapons that they ran out of ammo? They basically, that, yeah, that's what happened. They ran out of ammo. They had, they, they in, in the end, they just shouted at them, we're not your enemies, we're not your enemies. And the paramedic, she's I think 22, Yes. She came out, hands raised. And they killed her. And they just shot her. Yeah. They just shot her twice. Like they made sure she was dead. Mm. And one of the injuries, we can go, you know what, let's go inside and I'll All show right. you from the inside. So these are dedications from the families and the friends yeah. of the people who died here. Oh, okay. They were murdered here. Oh, the bullets all came through the wall. My goodness. Oh. This yes. is a paramedic. Yeah, that's a paramedic. Amit. Amit, Amit man. Amit man. Yeah, that's her name. She was, I think, only a year here. I barely knew her, only by face before this. But she was a really, you know, an upsetting citizen. Always took care of other people so she goes out she thinks maybe that if she puts her hands up she says I'm not your enemy then maybe they'll let her live she goes out and instantly they shoot her and kill her yeah and so I see the bullet holes inside this was coming from outside in but uh, yeah uh, this is not just bullet holes it's also grenade explosions that we can see over here over there. Well, this is a grenade. These are grenade explosions. Uh, that knocked the hole in the tile. They threw about, about, from what I read, eight grenades in. Eight grenades. Uh, even more. If, I don't know, like, this is what they said the after, but. Well, there's a trap on the wall. Only two people survived, one of the injured uh, first responders and a nurse. Mm -hmm. And they hid. Uh, one of them, the injured first response unit member, he hid right there. Half of his body, he, he hid right over there. And that's what saved him. They thought he was dead because he was covered in his blood. So he... he w he crawled up into the cabinets and like half of him was exposed. Yeah. And so they left him alone because they saw the blood and thought he was dead. Probably, yeah, mm. that's what he said. Mm. And at, at some point he stood over the window before, before then, he stood over the window and it was a barrel of a gun just aiming at him, like right here. And, and the, the terrorist just laughed at him and he pushed him away. And, and the terrorist threw a grenade and said, here, just for laughs, like in Hebrew, stam kacha, bishvila tzokim, just for laughs. And that grenade killed his friend who was over here, as he said. And it's just... It's hard to take in. Yeah. I know it's hard to talk about. Yeah. And I, I watched his in interview a dozen times and it's just, it's so hard. John Wesson and their second five. Did the two first responders survive? The, the soldiers? No, the soldiers the did not survive. One of the injured and the nurse. It was just luck that they didn't find them alive in here because they just executed everybody they saw and 
him they thought he was already dead, I guess. And, and this is just like supposed it. to be a dentist's office. Yes, over there there were like dentist uh, beds and like, you know, where they treat them. Uh, they're not there right now, but they were over there. And it's really unrecognizable. Unrecognizable. Yeah. So we are leaving the public and educational area into more of the neighborhoods of this side of the kibbutz. And yeah, you can see a lot of the houses standing strong, you know, they're okay. Not, not a lot of damage, maybe not, not at all on the outside, but a lot of them, have, like a battle, a big battle occurred in a lot of them. A psychological battle, you can't, you can't grasp that. That's of course, of course. Uh, me, for example, me and my wife stayed in the safe room for 19 hours without electricity and with a small bottle of water and a couple of chocolates. 19 hours. For 19 hours, yes. And so you can see, like, this house looks pretty much okay, right? Right. But the top there, they, they use it as an advantage point to shut down any forces that they saw here. So this, I made this a shooting gallery. They, they were standing on that porch and shooting people at some point. I know because the neighbor, the one who was living downstairs, told me they kept hearing them. And you can see it here too. Even more substantial. They knew exactly where to go. They wanted better advantage points into all these areas. Anyone who tried to come in here, they shot him yeah. from, from that window. And in the bottom house over here, a good friend of mine, Noi Shosh, uh, he lived here with his wife, another dear friend, and they murdered him. They were in the safe room and apparently the, the doors of the safe rooms are not built to stand uh, firepower uh, like of like like what Hamas close, brought, yeah. Close firepower, so they shot at the door and eventually he was hit in the arm while he was holding oh, the right, door right. and he just died from blood loss. The wife took the kids and we can see over here, the window. She took the kids out of the window. Over there, she took him out, and and they ran to to the other to like to to another house. Uh huh. Imagine. So, so the, the daddy imagine was you in see the... your husband dying on the floor, and you can't do nothing about it, and you have to take your three kids out to run away from the terrorists who are inside your house. They so just jumped. She, had, she took the kids out of this window? The one uh, over there in the back. How long had you known Noi? A lot. Uh, I think about uh, 10 years. It's been 10 years since their wedding, so <laughs> even more than that. About 15 years, wow. maybe. Tell us a little bit about Noi. What did he do, and what do you remember the most about him? What do you. So he ran the, the auto shop here. Oh. It was really up and coming in, in that area. It was really making the place much more profitable and better. Mm. And he was such a great friend and a great person. Um, his kids are amazing, five to two. And he really liked uh, going on uh, trips with his four by four vehicle. Really great guy. Just a guy that loved life. And his wife and children did survive. Yes, they survived. They're okay. Um, I see him every week. And just an amazing family. More loss, more hurt, more pain. More pain. Yep. But I'm thankful his wife and his children live on to yes. to carry to, on his, to carry memory. his memory. Yeah. Yeah.
Wow. In this house over here, yeah. the damage was even more substantial. Um, they kidnapped people from this house and from that house. Uh, Yossi, Yossi Sharabi and uh, Ophir Angel. Uh -huh. And they were kidnapped from this house. They were kidnapped from that house. Yossi is still a hostage because he's a man over 18. He wasn't included in the deal, but Ophir, they released him in, the, in one of the first deals they made. And so he came back. They were, they all were also there with uh, Yossi's wife, Nira, and her, their three daughters. One of them is uh, Ophir's uh, girlfriend. They didn't take Nira and the girls because they didn't have place in the truck. They just but ran out of room. They ran out of room, so they left them for a bit, like outside, and they just ran away. So they were lucky that they didn't kidnap him, kidnap them. But here, they kidnapped an eight-year-old named Emily Hand, a 13-year-old named uh, Hilarotem, and her mother, uh, Raya. An eight-year-old, a 13-year-old, and a mother kidnapped right here. Yes. And have they been released in part of the... Yes, they were. Thankfully for us, they were Thank released. God. Yeah. And you can see that they didn't just kidnap the people. They made sure there was no house for them to come back to. Right. It's not about just murder, torture, kidnap. It's about the destruction and ruin of life. Exactly. Of life that have like nothing to do with theirs. Well, the question that comes to my mind, and I think it, it can become rhetorical, but it's not rhetorical. What did this mother and, and these two daughters, what did they do to deserve what they got? You know, just like me, they did nothing. They did nothing. This is, look at this place, it's a peaceful place. People here actually help God. Right, so to, to, let's go back to that for a second, the beginning of Kibbutz Berry. If I'm reading correctly, Kibbutz Berry has always been known to be a place of, of welcoming even Palestinian people yes. and, and giving them My work and My father employed them. a lot of Palestinians during his time here. When he worked uh, in the fields, he managed the jojoba oil uh, plant, like the plant of the jojoba. Yes, sir. And he employed a lot of Palestinians. They were friendly sat together at the dining hall and ate lunch, but those people, they're not in Gaza anymore. They left Gaza. Yeah. They, they saw what ha what's happening and they left. So the heart of this kibbutz was to love anybody from any background and, and allow them into the, into the community. Yes. And this and is the result. We will of see a house of uh, Tommy down the road. Tommy used to drove uh, people from like kids sick kids from the Gaza border to hospitals in Israel for treatment. Mm -hmm. And they just murdered her. They just took her out and shot her and burned her body. After the October the 7th attack, how long did you have to stay out of Kibbutz Berry before you could come back to see, is your home still there or, or did people just stay? So no, nobody stayed during the, I think it took like a week for people to come, the first people to come back. Watch out. So a week for people to return back. But it wasn't, it was just a few. Um, only in the coming weeks after, like, I think it took me a couple months to come back and feel like I'm, like, confident enough to come back sure. here for me. Um, but they had to come back after a week because they wanted to reopen the printing factory so people won't lose their jobs. We won't lose our clients. We won't lose our jobs. 
so they had to reopen the printing factory and they had to tend the fields and they had to tend whatever is left in here. Uh, so they came back. There was life yet to be lived. Things yeah. to do. Yeah. So you see that mark over there, the red, red circle and red dot? It means that there was some sort of maybe a body or an explosion or we don't know because every unit had their own markings and we don't exactly know what it was, but there was so a battle there was up an there. Incident there. There was something up there. Right. Even though the house looks perfectly fine. And I would imagine the army, once they arrived, had to take hours and hours to search every building and every space. Yes. To ensure that there were no hidden threats. They scanned the place over and over again for about a month and still after a month they found a, a grenade or something, mm. a booby trap. Wow. Yeah. So it, it, Beary is a really big kibbutz. 1,200 people lived here. In the reports that we read in the media, you know, over 99 people is what the common thread is, that over 99 people lost their life here. Is that the mm -hmm. sentiment in here, in the kibbutz amongst the people, that that's the number, around 99 people? Yeah, no, that, that is pretty much the number, you ever say one, uh, I think it's 98 or 99, yes, because, and we're still counting them because they took hostages. Yes. So we still count them as casualties of what happened here if they die in captivity. Sure. Now, the place I'm taking you right now, over here, is where my dad was last seen during October 7th. So I'll try to explain what happened uh, to him. Um, he had a girlfriend on that side of the kibbutz. Well, he was living on that side. Uh -huh. um, they were together for 20 years after my mother died of cancer when I was mm -hmm. young. And during October 7th, he heard that terrorists are coming into her home from her daughters who lived just over here. Uh, like her daughter called him and said, tourists are going into my mom's, I don't know what to do. And he said, I know, I don't know what to do either. Eventually, he, what we think he realizes, he can't really live through another tragedy in his life. He only lost my mother. Right. He couldn't lose another love of his life. So he just, he went out. He's 76 years old after a ankle surgery, it went out from his home on a mobility scooter to right, to for, the, for the elderly to try and rescue her. He made it all the way to the neighborhood, but then the terrorists were there in a big mass and they shot at him. Yeah. He was injured in his arm and he kept driving all the way over here. And two first responders who were in this house trying to f hold down this uh, area. Right. Uh, brought him in and what happened is the terrorists came in in big groups from each side of this building and they had to they had to run over here they just had to run so he couldn't run with them no he couldn't so he stayed there and that's the last thing we know about what happened to him Later on, the day after, a friend of mine who came in here and fought for two days, he recognized his body in the area, in the neighborhood close to his girlfriend, Yona, Yona's home. Oh, yeah, yeah. Being, tell, tell us again your father's name. We want to honor so, him. So, Modechai Nave, that's his name. He was born in uh, Romania. He wow. came into Israel when he was 11, they were poor and uh, they were Jewish. After the World War II, they looked for a better home and he found it here. Yeah. He really did. 
Uh, I'm going to show you where he was last seen. Right. There is some blood here, some blood there. Uh, it might be his. Uh, so. And they came, they brought him here. This is a safe room, uh, a standard safe room. And you can see the blood over here. I'm pretty sure that's his blood because uh, it's not substantial enough to die from it, but we also know he was injured in his arm and you can see sort of feathers like, of blood. And I found one of his sandals somewhere over here. So, yeah. Thank you for showing us this place. The first two people that perished at the gate here at Kibbutz Beri, if I have read the reports correctly, it was three friends who had left the Nova Music Festival and were trying to escape what was happening there. Yes. And when have, they uh... got to the gate, Hamas was already waiting for them. They were just waiting for somebody to come in and mm -hmm. they killed three young people in that car. Do you rem do you know who those three people were? No, uh, I didn't know those people, but we have a lot of uh, accounts of people escaping from the Nova Festival. To try to come here. To try to come here. And most of them found their death here, or some of them found their death here. So in this road, every house that we see, the people in them died, murdered. Every house? Every house. This house, that house, that house, that house, that house, that house. They're all dead. Everyone to death. They took it, most of them, they took him out. Yeah. Led them down that road over there to the, to the right, shot them, and burned some of them like in a big pile of bodies. It's unbelievable the brutality and all that were lost. You can see the faces. And this is where Yona, uh, my, my father's uh, girlfriend lived, 69 years old. Yep. And she was a part of your life. Yeah, I came here to Saturday dinners almost every week. Is this her? Yeah, that's her. It says, she was killed, brutally killed in this house. Yona Fliko. So you can see the place, it all burned down. And some of it was brought down because it was too dangerous. And terrorists came in here. It was in the beginning of the, of the day. Uh -huh. They tried to open it up. They opened it up by a lot of force, opened up the safe room where she was in. I can't even imagine. And you can see from the ceiling and the everything here, you can see that the fire started from here. Yeah. You know why? Yeah. Because they tried to open the door, they couldn't, so they Burn, they burned the, the place up from here so smoke would come in and smoke the people out. Yeah. And they did that in almost every house in this block. If people fought, fought them, tried to, tried to stay in the safe room. See how thick the set is on that wall mm -hmm. where the handprint is? So is this where she, is this where she was murdered? Yeah. It took them a month to find the remains of her. You see there's a, a line over there, a, a strip of nylon. This is the antiques department. It says uh, it's the antiques department uh, because they brought in here specially, special people from the antiques department to find her remains and to find uh, special objects, 
so the family could have something from here. Yeah. It took them a month. It took them a month. To identify. And we know about people that it took them even more. It's hard to imagine. Yeah. During that month, they didn't know if she was abducted, she was murdered, what happened to her. They just say, yeah, I'm saying they because it's, it's also me, but her daughter's completely devastated. Oh, I, I am so sorry. It just breaks our heart. I don't, I don't understand it. I don't either. I don't either. As I told you, it's really hard to grasp this kind of uh, brutality. It's just a, a sweet old lady in the neighborhood. Yeah. And so how do you handle the talking heads on TV that say, well, this was just resistance? <sighs> you laugh at them. You laugh at them because they, you know, they, they know, they either know nothing or they're just hateful people. Yeah. One or the other. Yeah. They're either ignorant or malicious. Yes. So you, you can't, you, so you really you can't deal with that. How attacking civilians, beheading babies, and a frightened lady, 76 years of age. In, 69. But 69 yeah. years of age in this room. Your dad was 76, right? Right, right. <coughs> yes. So, and then she's in there trying to beg for life and terrified. She was just a peaceful person. She would never lay a hand on anybody. And the lady on this side of this house was the lady that would haul uh, Palestinian children to medical care in Israel. Right. A I mean, peace-loving lady. This, it, this is the most confusing thing I have ever witnessed. It's, it's utter confusion. There's, there's no rhyme. There's no reason. There's no purpose. There's no identity to the cause of what this is. This is senseless, this is barbaric, this is atrocious. It's absolutely breathtaking, and it makes no sense. It doesn't, it doesn't. It makes no sense. You know, they, they said that before they came in here, they took drugs, so they won't have any remorse or fear or anything. They would, any conscience. What, what does that conscience? remind us of, though? If you go back in history, and he's talked about it a couple times today, combatants coming against civilians taking drugs. The SS battalions used to take the equivalent of modern day methamphetamine to be able to fight and to be brutal and to, to pillage and to rape and to harm. Here it is again. Yeah. But this isn't 1942, this isn't 1939, this is 2023 that this happened. Now we're in 2024, five months later, and it makes no sense. Yeah, and their weapon is, is fear. It's That's fear. It's you terror. said it. You, you said, said it, it a minute ago. You said it at the beginning. Their, their purpose wasn't, they left some of the most expensive buildings alone. It was the people they were after. They yeah. wanted to harm, they to wanted terrorize to harm, the people. Terrorize the people. And they came in through the fence, you see the fence over there? Yes, sir. So from that area, they came in with, with a lot of forces and just broke the fence. And they started with this houses. It started from here. These are the first houses hit? Yeah. He died, he tried to fight him off. He had a handgun, he tried to fight him off, but they shot him. They abducted his wife, who was probably injured from, from the battle here, into Gaza, and they found her body in Gaza. Mm -hmm. Judith Weiss and Shmurik Weiss. Again, parents of dear friends of mine. They're all people that I know. So he was killed here in the house in a firefight. She was taken to Gaza, and then her body was found later. Yeah, in, in a hospital, in the hospital in Gaza. So they'd taken hostages to the hospital in Gaza. Yes. And those who died there, they, they just left their bodies there in the fridge or something. Oh my. Uh, and it's, here is the Ben Ami family. I know there are two of their daughters. They were both taken hostage. Laz was fortunately released during one of the deals, but uh, her husband, Oad, is still there 
for more than 150 days now. Yeah. Remember that video I told you about an elderly with crutches yes, coming I've in? I've seen it. It's, that's the gate. That's the gate. They came in through here. Young kids. Yeah. Teenagers. Teenagers and elderly. I watched it again last night. So in this neighborhood, they, also, they already started to clear the rebels, but they left this house because it's under military investigation of what happened here. There was a big hostage situation here. They took uh, 14 people around this neighborhood, uh -huh. from the houses around and the houses here, took him to this house, held him hostage uh, for many hours. Um, the Israeli army tried to negotiate and we don't know exactly what happened, but eventually um, they fired, a, the, the tank fired a missile or a few missiles into the building uh -huh. and killed almost anybody who was there. One survivor came out of it. Um, the wife of uh, Adi Dagan is there on the bottom right. Yeah. His wife is the only survival and she survived because he hugged her, basically protecting her from all the explosions, from all the wow. fire. And there was another hostage who survived, but she went out before. One of the terrorists decided that he doesn't want to be part of it anymore. He took one hostage out as like a guarantee and surrendered himself. Like a passport to get out of the house. Yeah. But the rest, 40 terrorists, stayed with 14, 13 people until uh, the army decided that they can't negotiate and try to just fight them. Uh, we don't know exactly what, why at that point the army decided to breach in, why they fired a tank missile into the building. As Yoni said, uh, it took them more than how many days to around two months to identify Liel, the second on the on the right in the top, 13 year old child. They took her hostage. They took her hostage. It's insane. It's insane. It, as we finish our, our visit with Kibbutz Berry and we take in everything that we've seen, what would you want to say to the world, especially to Americans who are watching this? What would you want them to know? What would be your message to them today? My message is that this kind of thing that happened here, it was real. It happened. You got to believe that. You got to believe the people, the victims, were peaceful people. They didn't want war, but Hamas poisoned the mm. people in Gaza. They poisoned them and they made them, th that poison flushed in here by the hundreds and killed and murdered and whatever, they took hostage and all of my friends, all of my family was affected by this. And it's just, a, it's not just here, it's in other kibbutzim as well. Right. This was just a, the biggest uh, event that it happened here, but it happened all around this area, a peaceful area. You gotta believe it. And you gotta do something about it. Yeah.